Okay, we, we see everything. I might not see everything, therefore I need my reading glasses. Uh, good evening again from me, and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about the C++ core guidelines and safer code. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am or where I am, I'm a professor for software engineering at HSR Rapperswil, and that's the campus. We have a, a little harbor there, directly adjacent to the Lake Zurich, so we have the most beautiful campus in Switzerland. That's our claim. At least the location is very nice. And uh, I even have in the end a picture uh, how it looks like in winter. That's a summer picture. Guidelines. If you hear that word, oh, I should stay, stay here, sorry, not wandering around. <laughs> Uh, if you hear the word guidelines, the nice thing I can actually see the projection in the in the uh, window, so I don't even have to look down here. It's just mirrored. Um, one can think of several things. One, like okay, German autobahn, you have these lanes and you know where to go, and you go 200 and it's fine, or 220 as today, unless there are uh, jams, accidents trucks or slow cars from Switzerland. But even those guidelines depend heavily on culture if they're actually followed. If you go to, let's say, southern Europe, beginning in France, or some other areas, these lines on the road are not really guidelines. They're, let's say, estimates for the number of vehicles going parallel along the road. <laughs> And anybody who's laughing who has been somewhere in Italy or France or somewhere else where these lines actually don't guide at all. It's just, let's say, incidentally that cars don't crash into each other. But people work, traffic flows, people work with that so they actually don't follow the guidelines and still you get usable stuff. On the other hand, a guideline might feel like, oh, you're the dog on a leash. And depending on your uh, guide, is actually it, it might be comfortable or not very comfortable. It might be strangle you, depending on how far away you want to get. And I always remember those uh, zipper lines where people with very small dogs might actually try to, to pull back the dog by, by pressing the zipper. Uh, that's zip back. And there are other guidelines that might be really actual hard walls where you guide it like the kettle in that uh, interesting uh, facility there. I'm not sure what they're doing uh, with them, but nevertheless, it might actually narrow you down what you can do. And if you look at different guidelines for different environments, all of these things can be true at the same time. So you're either, let's say, allowed to follow or conveniently disobey to get uh, to become faster, you might be uh, held back from actually doing the stuff you want to do, or you might be actually feel like in a straight jacket only allowed to do very straight ahead things that might not lead you to the goal that you actually want to go to. And these C++ core guidelines have all of those as well, and if you, uh, I want to show you a couple of other guidelines as well that I I'm in, in touch with and with, uh, within the C++ domain and uh, give you a little overview. That's a picture I created not to only show how um, many people work on guidelines and how different, different guidelines you get. We have on the left hand side the C++ core guidelines which are still evolving so we don't have a release 1.0 yet. We just got a release in January which I haven't uh, analyzed completely so if I say something that's no longer there it's because I looked there the last time. We have uh, quite an interesting uh, thing by the SEI cert the, the uh, security people who also provide C++ uh, coding standard or guidelines. The thing is, some people told me, oh, it's not an official release, it's just what they ended up as a working draft and put it on the internet. On the other hand, it's very quite modern compared to other guidelines and uh, quite good. And 
I'm a member of the ISO committee for C++, but I also recently joined a working group uh, which is actually for uh, considering programming language vulnerabilities. So let's say weak potential weaknesses of languages, in quotes, that uh, can actually hinder the safety or security of a solution written in that language. Like, okay, you have a pointer, and if that pointer is a pointing not to a valid address, you might get interesting results or undefined behavior. And most of the uh, programming language have some issues with potential, what in C++ and C is called undefined behavior, or where misbehavior or behavior is different from a typical programmer's expectation. And there are other areas where safety is important. Safety is always, okay, is human life at risk? Like, okay, I cut my finger, might be a safety issue, or I die, which is a bigger safety issue. And there is an established uh, standardization group for safety critical system that is came from the automotive sector, but is applied in many other sectors as well. That's MISRA. And they have uh, quite established uh, MISRA C guidelines, and they also have C++ guidelines from 2008. The problem with the MISRA C++ guidelines of 2008, if you're a modern C++ programmer, they look miserable. Is anybody here, oh, I, I forgot to ask my audience, is anybody here doing safety critical C++ solutions? Daily or sometimes? Car industry, automotive, okay. Trains, aviation, office, okay. Um, which could be safety grill as well, especially when I have to bang my head on my desk because something doesn't work in one of my office products, uh, regardless of the vendor. <laughs> And especially that miserable Misra C++ of 2008 is a reason that other people try to write better guidelines for C++, for modern C++. One large group, and some member, or at least one member is here, is uh, Autosar. Autosar is known for, uh, let's say, uh, for a specification for control units in the cars for C, and they understood and learned that C and the, this kind of a way of doing things is no longer suitable for the vision of self-driving cars or even for what a modern car today looks like. I wonder that after seeing that specification and seeing some of the things uh, that people try to solve within the limits of Autosar, it's amazing that cars still drive. <laughs> at all. Um, from time to time, yes, but at all, and most, most of the time it's quite amazing. On the other hand, for C++ and self-driving cars, they learned the complexity cannot be coped with C. We need a more modern language, a more higher level abstractions. And then they looked at Misra and said, oh no, that, those guidelines don't actually fit, suit our needs for modern C++ and modern uh, uh, guidelines for safety critical systems and th then therefore they started out their own C++ guidelines by taking into account the uh, core guidelines, the MISRA guidelines and also the other guidelines, high integrity C++ or the SEI cert C++ coding guidelines. If you look at these standards, MISRA is a brand so if you ever do anything in automotive in the future people will expect you to follow some MISRA standard because they, they had have this brand of, okay, if you do it like that, at least you won't get the Toyota incidents that uh, where the accelerator got stuck without the pedal pressed. And if you look at the area, I have to show it like that. These three areas and some of the dots, there are a lot of vendors, tool vendors, who actually provide you with tools and sell you partially very expensive tools to actually check for uh, 
that you follow these guidelines. And they will print reports with thousands of violations or only a few ones, depending how you configure the tools. And these reports actually go into the documentation of your uh, ISO 26262. Is that number? Anybody safety? Yes, someone is. Uh, and, and if you have documented that you have run the tool and have documented where the violations are, that they are reasonable, then you actually have a safe system. Which doesn't mean it's safe at all. It means you have followed the process and you won't get sued too much from uh, if something fails. If you wouldn't have followed that process, uh, let's say the liability might be bigger. Those tool vendors usually don't have an interest that the programmers get better. Why? Because they will, uh, would sell fewer licenses or the need for the tools would be less appreciated by those people who actually have to pay the big checks to, to, to the, for the licenses. To actually get, get better at something, you need as immediate feedback as possible. And that's, if you, if you want to learn something, you need to get immediate feedback. If you touch a hot, hot oven, you get immediate feedback because your nerve center reflects and you will pull back. And if you tell your kids, don't touch that, also the immediate feedback is important. It's not, oh, after two weeks, oh, you have still blisters. Maybe you shouldn't have touched that. That's not a good idea, a good teaching <sighs> feedback. It has to either heard immediately or at least get the feedback immediately. And for developers, we are lazy. A good developer is always lazy. We want to write as or work as little as possible or write as little code as possible. Uh, so getting immediate feedback about bad or ugly things that is, is important. And now that's why I have this on my slide because we are a tool developer, not a vendor. We, we give it away for free. But we, uh, based on uh, Eclipse CDT, we created an, a C++ IDE where we try to implement many of my ideas or my students' ideas and provide that for the general public. So we are not a research institute, a research university. We are a university of applied sciences. We teach engineers. We create engineers, practitioners. So we can actually afford to have them work on usable tools, not PhDs. And we are about to release a new version. The release build was built this afternoon, but it's not yet online for the general public because we need to check if it's actually working. And I couldn't check it this afternoon because the internet connection in the hotel is too slow. Okay, that's... It's a kind of non-commercial commercial, this talk, but nevertheless, I want to teach you something as, as a teacher about the C++ core guidelines. It's still a work in progress. I wrote that blurb about one and a half years ago, and it's still valid. And most of the things in the guidelines, or in many of these guidelines, what we have seen before is don't get the pink elephants. Get rid of undefined behavior. The good thing is in C++ we have a lot of areas of undefined behavior, which is good, because compilers can do interesting things. It's on the other hand also and makes uh, programs actually faster because of undefined behavior, but it might make the life of a, let's say, John Doe programmer, the average programmer, much, much harder because you have to take care that you're writing code that it doesn't go into undefined behavior land because then the compiler can do interesting stuff to your code. Or it, and the problem is undefined behavior can actually mean it behaves as you expect from time to time, which is not always true. It might behave as you expect in debug mode, but when you turn on the optimizer, it might just do something else. Another goal of the C++ core guidelines is actually helping people who grew up with C++ in the 90s or zeros to write more modern C++ as given by C++ 14 or later. And I grew up in the 90s with C++. Maybe I'm my first C++ program I compiled in 1989 or so, or 88. Mm, forgot. Um, so I know a lot about how we wrote C++ in the 90s. And before templates actually worked, that was the way to do. 
it. And it was still complicated getting a hold of all the pointers and uh, getting things uh, right and uh, understanding virtual. You can only understand a dynamic polymorphism if you understand design patterns, elements of reusable object oriented design. Who has not read design patterns or head first design patterns? Okay. Not read. Head first? Are you a programmer? <laughs> <laughs> Um, learn about them. Do you know what command means? They are even important for understanding non-dynamic polymorphic uh, architecture. So if you write software and don't know about patterns, go for it. Um, okay. The underlying idea, even for the core guidelines, is not only, okay, hand-waving and telling you you should do that like that or, that, uh, or the, uh, those things. It's also what always had the idea of providing static analysis tools to help you to get feedback. And that's where um, Eclipse CDT comes with, the, uh, with a nice framework for writing such static analysis tools that can actually run while you're editing the code. So like the word spell checker, it will provide wiggly lines and little markers. And that's an important thing, especially because uh, we, my institute, my students and assistants, we created the refactoring infrastructure for C++ for Eclipse CDT. And we employ that in these static analysis checkers as quick fixes for remedies so we can actually immediately on your behalf refactor the code and get rid of the problem that you introduce if it's possible or at least we can generate an attribute or a comment that says tells the tooling okay ignore it in this case because i deliberately turn it off now back to the core guidelines commercial breakover the philosophy is teaching people writing modern c++ code so who is using STD equals 17 as their compiler setting right now? 14? 11? 03? <laughs> Poor guys. <laughs> um, I think there's no longer reason to write C++03 code unless you have a very old code base that needs to be uh, supported on very old hardware still. But even then it might benefit from compiling it with a more modern compi uh, compiler setting to get a better feedback. Or oh, who is using C? Oh, shame. Shame on you. Do you compile it with C++? <laughs> Do you compile it with C++? Who is forced to use C? <laughs> <laughs> huh? uh, let's say using in a professional setting and write code that goes out to other people. <laughs> Just a side note, Google invented Go to help their bad C programmers writing ba uh, worse Go code. <laughs> Other joke. Okay, the guidelines have typical things like good naming. I just figured out that they added a thing about how to place const, and I think they are wrong. But they just do what everybody else is doing wrong. And Telling people to do the wrong thing because everybody is doing the wrong thing is not a good thing. But that's, I have another slide on, on what, what are my criticisms on, on the uh, core guidelines and that's one of them just from the top of my head. It comes with a support library that allows you to actually use stuff that might come in the standard in the future but is not yet in 17 or 14. I believe they have some duplication with, four, with 17 because when the guideline support library came out, um, at least some of the vendors' compilers didn't support 17 yet and didn't have the library support for the features, and that's where they came in. Other stuff they promoted 
but it didn't get into the C++ 17 standard yet, so it's on the schedule for 20 because of timing and the release plan. Like, uh, for example, span t is, is something where that's a substitute for passing arrays by pointer and count or by two pointers to, to a function. And it's kind of a reference for a contiguous sequence of elements or a reference for an array without the underlying uh, memory. And that's something that's pr uh, proposed for the C++ standardization but not yet in. Okay, what's in there? I have to show you my little C++ face and a lot of traffic signs, at least for those in, in uh, German context will easily understand those. We have these uh, 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 Verbotsschilder. So Verboten is writing things like new and delete or writing your own copy or move operations or even your own destructor. Some of that is known as a rule of zero. We have uh, curly braces for initialization. We have algorithms instead of loops. So reuse instead of uh, redo or copy paste. Or auto is also interesting. That's all talks I gave in the past just to remind you what my philosophy is. So some random, really random things like, OK, prefer the standard library over to other libraries and to handcrafted code. And this is a version, not the current release, so it might have changed what's under ES1. It will still be the same, but the examples might be different. For example, the second example is actually not working currently in C++. It might work when we get ranges, but we don't have that yet in C++17. Uh, so instead of writing a loop that counts and sums up elements, you use a function that does what it do, accumulate, or you can call reduce which is actually the functional term for the same operation, uh, who has not called accumulate in one of his or her code bases yet. Shame on you. <laughs> Who's writing for loops with, with an index still? Ooh. I give all my students tasks, solve these problems without a, a loop, use the standard library algorithms. And that's an important thing because there you can, first your functions will be, look like very linear code, which is easy to test. You have to write very few test cases. McCabe complexity is one in your own code. And you can trust that the people who wrote the standard library have a good test suit and their tests work and their implementations of the functions actually do what they pretend to do or what's specified in the standard and accumulate and if you have never included algorithm or functional to your code you have something to learn okay other thing okay if you have switch statements and everything with the case, uh, every case with the break, which is a common mistake in C and C++ that you have fall through without you want that. And that's also something that's quite easy to check. The first one is not so good. You, you might not want to actually mark every loop by a static analysis tool and say, consider refactoring that to call an algorithm, because some loops are still required because you might have a domain specific, very specific problem or you might not have the brains to figure out which of the many algorithms actually to call, which is also sometimes a problem. We tried to automate that in the past, but it's quite hard to do it beyond simple examples. But for the break stuff in the switch statement, that's actually very easy to check and we have a checker in, in CVELOP that actually provides you with either adding a break a statement or um, at a, a comment that you actually want to fall through either by, by an attribute or a comment. Who's forgotten a break statement in this or her switch statement in the past? At least once? <laughs> okay, I, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Happens too easily. What are some of the problem areas addressed? Resource leaks is an important thing. Is anybody of you still using raw pointers? How about no one? Oh. For non-owning 
we even have the observer pointer now. So I think raw pointers, if you have a code base where you have, I wouldn't say pointers are useless, but they are very, very dangerous. And we have optional now in the standard. And that's, that's an important substitute where, for return values where you might use a pointer to signify that, okay, if I return a null pointer, I don't have a result, and otherwise you get some address to some state, and you better care about the memory where it's stored, uh, uh, so you can get the, the result back. That's in some of the C library functions we have that. In some others you get a pointer back to an internal structure, which you better not free. And that's the curse of pointers. You never know, they don't carry the semantics and the usage guidelines on what to use that. The core guidelines try to help you with that by introducing a thing about ownership and they have something that I actually deliberately deleted from that slide. They propose that you mark owning pointers with an owner wrapper around the type, which is actually not a, a wrapper, it's just a type there for the pointer. And then they pretend to have static analysis tools that actually check that you manage the ownership correctly. In my personal opinion, that's a complete mistake of what to do, because if you have ownership of a pointer, use unique pointer and make unique to instantiate that and to create it. And not and pass the ownership with the unique pointer and not by marking your plain pointer and not changing your code to keep it around like that. Question? Also in the implementation detail of vector. I think vector itself is a good use case for using raw pointers in the kernels and then might need to mark this so that tools can work. The, the, the ownership stuff is, in my opinion, a mistake. And I wouldn't want to mark all my standard library pointers where internally as a standard library implementer I do it first because I've done it always like that and second because it's more efficient with my concrete compiler uh, to actually make it work. But that's not user level code. All user level code should get rid of these new delete and things where you have your own pointers where you manage lifetimes. And that's the problem with the ownership thing to actually make a useful tool. You have to actually change all your standard library that does use pointers to mark these ownership things, which is something I don't, uh, I think won't happen. Only maybe our hosts will do that for their own library and provide the tooling around that, but that's not a general aspect to, to, uh, to do. Okay, memory is an issue and you should, as a normal, let's say, non-standard library implementer or non-high sophisticated library implementer, you should actually avoid using pointers or resource management by hand. Another thing that is let's say disallowed by all kind of coding guidelines is no pointer arithmetic. I know of C programmers and assembly programmers who believe that they can actually outperform the compiler optimizer by writing pointer arithmetic themselves. Those times have been over for 40 years or so. Maybe Kerninghen and Ritchie on the original PDP-11 with their small C compiler might have benefited from writing plus plus instead of uh, prefix instead of postfix and make things slightly faster with their machine. But those times are over. We have highly sophisticated compilers today who actually create code that you might not know that it's correct exactly representing what you intend to write. Um, if you're talking about the old Kyle ARM 5, version 5, I doubt. But that's only because all the users are not asking them for value for the money they charge for the compiler licenses. 
They are trying to make it better. The new version is based on Clang. The unfortunate thing is the Clang license allows them to do their own things without telling what version of Clang and what features of Clang they're actually providing. And I asked deliberately and I got very, a very interesting answer back that wasn't actually, I wasn't satisfied with the, with the reply by the ARM compiler team. But that's a very vendor specific and I'm sure there might be people around who can do better and if you ask nicely and pay enough money, people might actually do better. Or if you kick arm in the, in the back and tell them to do their job correctly. But I understand they have a tough thing because all the little uh, microcontrollers behave slightly different, look, uh, looking alike. It's like a maze of twisted little passages all alike. If you ever know that phrase. Who's knowing that phrase? Nobody old enough. Look for a maze of twisted little passages. You learn something beyond C++ from me. Oh, my take on C++ guidelines. There are a lot of pros. It's fosters modern C++ style. If you only have a compiler and don't know what to do with it, go for the guidelines. Look at what they teach you. It's a lot less undefined behavior if you follow many of the, the guidelines there. It provides pointer safety. It shows you that you should use RAII, resource acquisition is initialization. Who has not heard of RAII before? Look it up, Google it, read talks about it. If you do C++ and not knowing what RAI means, you shouldn't run a compiler. My, I, I still dream of a compiler with feedback that actually has a kind of electroshocker that gives you <laughs> actually, <laughs> if you do things like that. Uh, it tells you some good guidelines about parameters and not using globals, for example. About design patterns, who is using a singleton design pattern still? That's an anti-pattern. Don't! Don't! Stop! If you do globals, write a global variable. Don't do singleton. Never ever anymore. It was invented to circumvent a drawback of C++ in the 90s. And that drawback still exists, but it's still not a good idea. It's about, okay, static initialization across module bound or, or compilation unit boundaries is the sequence is undefined. So you make it dynamic after main started, and uh, therefore you introduce singleton for dynamically allocating resources. And even then, if you have a circular dependencies, even your singletons don't initialize correctly. That's the problem. So just don't use singleton. Globals are verboten because we have multi-threading in the language right now and if you have global state that is mutable it needs to be protected otherwise you will have serious problems pink elephants is a simple one your code will not work mutable statics broken code in modern C++. It used to work in the 90s perfectly. We had a single core, single processor. I can, can tell you war stories about, oh, we have this interesting counter. It's atomic because it's just an int. Oh no, if you have four processors on a single machine, it's no longer atomic. And all your tests run on a, a cheaper, non-multiple processor workstation because you couldn't afford that. But the server where your code would run, Interesting. Big, aha. Uh -huh. Live through that. Okay. Less verbosity. That's something where people claim, oh, I come back to you. Where people claim, oh, why should I call accumulate? I can write a loop and I see what my code does. No, you don't. Less code equals more software. And there was a question. Passing by par past parameters. 
My students write code and I forbid them to use globals like C in, C out. Only the main function is allowed to actually use those and pass them as an argument to one of the other functions you call. Because you cannot write decent unit tests for a code that employs singletons or globals, mutable globals. Use parameters. And if you have too many of them, like the Windows API does, bundle them. There's a pattern called a context object. So there's more than just the 23 design patterns in the Gang of Four book. The, uh, a context object where you can actually combine them. And that's something I taught the C programmers in the 80s, where, oh, you have a function with more than three, argument, uh, three parameters. Well, maybe you have a missing an, uh, uh, an abstraction, what I would say today. Then we said, okay, pack them in a struct and pass a struct instead. And even then you could pass structs by value, which people didn't know because the very, very, very early compilers couldn't do that. But even the C compilers in the 80s could pass structs by value. Okay, common sense is not like don't use singleton, is, as we have seen, not so common. Um, a lot of Cisms and 90s C++ is, uh, let's say, disencouraged and it provides transformation for, okay, change that. And many of the guys are, and it comes with the helper library for stuff that's not yet in the standard or stuff that might be useful to employ that. And it provides a potential for static analysis. At least most of the rules tell you if it's feasible to write static analysis or if they have done it already or not. Disadvantages. And that's where the interesting part comes. It's just too many rules to know by heart. Especially if you're new to the area and don't have an environment with your colleagues that actually are very good at very modern C++ and there are not that many in a regular setting. Maybe those people who come here regularly are there because you actually enjoy learning more about C++ and you actually want to get better programmers by writing less code. But in many areas, people just are ignorant or not taught that way. I have attended online courses on C++ maybe five years ago or three years ago and I was shocked by the bad, let's say, approach they taught C++. I'm teaching C++ on, on, in my university since 2004 and I taught C++ from the 90s on and used it also in the real environment, not only uh, as today they where I just write simple example and exam programs, but very often you people live in, a, in an area where they use a language without any kind of proper culture around that. And C++ has that problem because it comes from, it evolved over so long time, so people got different uh, levels of learning, and man, many people come from C and learn C first, and that's actually a bad starting point for doing good C++. So forget all what you learned in C, just keep it in the back of your mind if you, if you come across some interesting behavior because you shouldn't write C code in C++. Another thing, there's overlap in the rules. So we not only have these many rules, we have rules that actually tell you about the same thing in different ways, sometimes even redundantly. The categories are not always clear. Is it in, should I look for something in that in expression and statements or in functions? It's only sometimes common sense and not a good thing to, okay, what should I really do? I shouldn't do that, but what, what's, how can I get rid of singletons, for example? Uh, some rules are very spe specialist rules, like if you come to a corner where you have to write your own swap functions or swap specialization, uh, uh, swap overloads, so swap overloads, that's an area you shouldn't go there. If you go there, you have actually violated many of the other rules before to actually get there. And that it's not too hard to get around and keep a stick with the compiler provided code. That's my forbidden uh, phase that actually does the right thing. Sometimes it might be too modern. We learned, oh, we have 2003 support. 
then the core guidelines as is don't work well enough. And okay, some of the helpers in the library are obsolete by 17 or maybe 20. And again, whenever you see someone proposing owner, ask them why not unique pointer? Because that's actually what should be there. And it's not too much to refactor from a plain pointer where you write new to make unique and a unique pointer. Anybody using owner? Okay. If you have a plain pointer, allocate it with new, delete or malloc, wrap it with a unique pointer and you're done. So the good thing about the core guidelines, and that's sometimes missing from guidelines that are very tool oriented like MISRA is the philosophy behind them. And that's something, one thing is express ideas directly in code. Common slide. Whenever you write a function where you write an inline comment explaining the behavior of that piece of code that comes next, that's actually an excuse for not refactoring by extracting that piece of code as a separate function and name it in the way that it behaves. I lived in times where we had only six significant characters in a function identifier. These times are long over. We, can, we now can use long names and C++ is partially guilty for that because we have this name mangling scheme for the brain dead linkers we still have to employ. But nevertheless, we can use good names. And it's not a problem if you have many small, tiny functions because first, they are easily to grasp, they're easy to test, and you can automate those small, easy tests. And there is less chance to have ridiculous control flow that you can no longer understand. Who's right? Who's writing functions more than a couple of times, longer than 20 lines? A hundred? I tell you a story. I've been at Google in Zurich in their offices a couple of years ago, and they had these 30-inch widescreen 20 by 10 monitors, and they put them vertically. Whenever someone is doing that, they have very big brains, but very bad culture for coding. <laughs> when, when I taught C in the 80s, it was 80 by 25. No longer should, the function should always fit on a terminal screen. And that's still more or less a reasonable size. Some people say a function longer than 10 lines is bad. But C++ sometimes makes it a little bit hard. But because you don't want to have the 20 inch wide for a single line full of code and no white space. That's also not a very good idea. Okay, write an ISO standard C++. And this is something that comes from people from Microsoft. And they are guilty of providing features for their users which are not part of the language standard. And they know that they are guilty, but they still did it. And GNU compiler is, is guilty as well in another direction. And many other compilers, smaller compiler vendors, actually, I, I should uh, deliberately manage to mimic non standard extensions so that their compiler would actually compile code that is non standard even including bugs, to get it compiled. Don't. The standard people try hard to make stuff backward compatible and will tell you deliberately when it's no longer the case. And we might even create a refactoring that actually takes you from one style of code to the next one automatically. And don't do these interesting extensions like managed C++, which is not C++. It's just C sharp with the, with the C++ syntax. ISO standard. And use the standard library as well. And not the C library. Express intent, which is common uh, 
sense, but not always common. Statically type safe. Type systems have been, let's say, also decades long a topic of research, but we can actually employ them now. And the C++ type system can be very interesting, but we implemented a Swift parser and their type system is even more interesting. You need a constraint solver in the parser to actually solve the type, uh, uh, to, to type check a Swift program. So C++ is simple in that sense. And if you write code, write it in a type safe manner. So every cast you is I consider is a design problem in your code. Even the named casts. And the C casts are forbidden anyway. What cannot be checked at compile time should be check checkable at runtime. And that's something okay. The core guidelines tell you to use exceptions because the standard library uses exceptions. And that's something where the embedded people versus the ARM person they are not allowed to use exceptions. That might change in the future, but it heavily depends on the quality of the exception implementation of your vendor, and it might lead to non-deterministic runtimes in some areas, but you might have threats that actually are behaving deterministically, beha be depending on your, uh, on your uh, let's say, operating system and compiler, but you still might not want to use exceptions. Um, Autosar allows you exceptions in C++. Misra is considering them for, let's say, but telling you when, when and when not. If you have very tiny systems with hard real-time constraints, you might not want to use exceptions that hard real-time stuff, you, but you might, for example, use it somewhere else to get, let's say, same behavior and employ the standard library because it's defined based on exceptions. But that's, let's say, it's not a done deal, or in Bavarian, a commodity reason. Who says? Um, catch runtime errors early. If you bail out from main, that might be too late for you. Don't leak resources. That's also RAII. Don't waste time and space. Well, because it's C++, you should write efficient code, and the standard library usually provides more efficient algorithms that, than you can come up with. At least they come with a complexity guarantee. Prefer immutable data to mutable data. Const is a friend who has a code base that is const clean. <laughs> who is struggling with getting const right or at all? No longer. Who is in between? Sometimes problems with const, sometimes not. Okay. Try develop. We have a, a plugin that actually provides you with suggestions to add const to your code base, and will do it for you in the right place, or at least where you con where you consider it right. Const is a friend, especially with uh, let's say reasoning about code, and also with compiler uh, compile time computation. Learn about const expert if you uh, want to do that. Mutable data is dangerous in multi-threaded environments. What about quantum basic types? What's that? What about quantum basic types? Sorry, I, I did. What about constant basic types? Constant? Int? Constant? Using constant basic types. Um, if you use basic types, there's another pattern lurking that's missing from your code base. It's whole value. You should actually mark each type with the, uh, let's say, each thing in your code that has an abstraction shouldn't be represented by an int or a double, but should have a unit wrapper showing, okay, this int is meters per second or ticks per whatever thing. And if you use int or double often in your code, you might miss an opportunity for type check your code because one int might be a different type in the system conceptually from the other. And if you have const with ints, fine. Why not? 
it's good because once it's set and it has to be initialized, it won't change. And you can reason, okay, this is always five. It's not like Fortran where you, Fortran 4, where you could actually have a constant somewhere and because everything was passed by reference, it could mutate that constant with interesting effects. Okay, cons is your friend. And encapsulate ugly things. Don't copy-paste them. And this 12 and 13, that's the new, newer stuff. Use support tools and use support libraries as appropriate. And that's as appropriate is always a thing. Don't be too religious, but follow the underlying values behind that. And now I'm well in the time slot, so I won't go over all these examples. I just added them because I thought I would have actually uh, a lot of time. Just an example how it would look like. Oh, there's a word, piece of word, and oh, it's initialized, and our tooling would suggest add a const here, and if you press Control 1, it will actually do that for you, or if you press return when you have that there. And that's the result. And if you insist on having const word instead of word const, you get that as well. You just have to configure the, the rewriter uh, accordingly. This is a configuration flag. And you see? Unit test. Unit test uh, should use this one for an output operator of a deliberate class that wraps a string and giving it a more semantic meaning. It's not just a string, it's a word. Oh, maybe refactoring. I've asked who has read the design patterns book? Who has read Refactoring by Martin Fowler and Friends? Who has heard the term refactoring at all? <laughs> Okay, who has never heard the term refactoring? Who has a project task or a, a larger project work item called refactoring? Shame on you. Because that's not refactoring, that's rewriting. Refactoring is what happens on a daily basis while your code making it more beautiful and cleaner. That's refactoring. And remember, Less code equals more software was, was the title of a talk in the past. Get rid of complexity. Um, there are myths, and I highlighted those on this slide because all declarations on top of the function, there have been guidelines saying that. And it was the age of Pascal. Who has learned Pascal as a first or early language? There are still old guys here and ladies. In Pascal, it was due to the, let's say, the inability of the compilers when Niklaus Wirth actually wrote them. And I've seen the source code of the Pascal compilers by Niklaus Wirth, and you know why. Um, it's not the case in C or C++ anymore. A single return rule, who is following that? And some of the safety guidelines tell you so. They make the control flow ugly. And you need the wide screens to actually get the nesting done. Or you use go to then, which is verboten as well. Single return is also bullshit. It only helps if your functions actually go to the vertical uh, screen with the 20 inch, or uh, 20 to 10 thing. If you write functions like that, where you can see all return statements on one glance, your function is too long. Refactor. Um, one class per source file, or no exceptions. That depends on context. I know there are areas where mm, our compiler's exception handling is non deterministic, and we need to know that's only 10 milliseconds happening there. One class per source file, or two phase initialization. Who writes an init member function, or something like that? Once an object is constructed, it should be ready to use. Whenever you had that, it's because of, let's say, ugly non-understanding of constructors 
time because oh we need a default constructor why well otherwise we cannot put it in that container that we happen to use that's just a bad excuse and those times are over we have now move abilities of types so you can actually have containers that have non-existing space where no object lives and then move into that space when you actually fill it uh, go to exit things that comes uh, uh, cor corollary from the single return rule don't do that cleanup code has to be done with RAII so there should be an infrastructure for that and one thing I'm just promising something will happen there is something called the rule of zero as of C++11, the compiler provides for you a whole bunch of functionality and more than even before, more even than before, we have these move operations as well, not only constructor, uh, not only default constructor or destructor or copy constructor and copy assignment. We also have move construction and move assignment and the compiler will select whatever it thinks is appropriate or the standard defines. And writing those beasts by hand, on your own, correctly, is experts only land. It's very hard to do it correctly in all cases, and the compiler will do it correctly for you in all cases. So better let the compiler do his job. There are some exceptions. To the rule of zero we have to do something okay one is if you write OOH code who is using virtual regularly think about it do you really need compile time dynamic typing or are you just lazy to write a template instead that uses a generic parameter think about it and you can even implement the design patterns in a generic way, which is another talk I should give here when I'm back in Munich. <laughs> um, there are reasons you want to write your own resource acquisition is initialization class, which might go away because I worked hard with some others to get a type called unique resource into the standard of C++20. It's on its way. It's not yet in the standard paper, but it's just one or two meetings away, I believe. Unless they come, someone comes up with a, a serious problem in the specification and the imp or the implementation. So once we have a unique resource, you will never want to write your own RAII class again. And that's good. Whenever you have to manage two resources in a single resource management class that's almost close to impossible in a generic way if the resources are let's say windows handles that's easy because those are integers but if the resources are some generic type where some user might provide you with very interesting behavior on copy or move operations or destruction that's something you don't want to go there and I know that because I had to implement unique resource when I specified it and that's one thing where you actually need to manage two things, the resource and the deleter object, which might be an object with interesting behavior. Don't go there, just use unique resource from now on and unique pointer and no other resource management things. Or if you write your own container classes, don't use the standard containers maybe you write adapters or wrappers but don't write your own containers unless you actually know what you're doing and if you're doing that propose them for standardization if they're generic we're still missing some and that's the rule of zero c.20 if you can avoid defining default operations in the core guidelines do and now I need to run a little bit. I have some more slides on, oh, that's my owner thing. Don't do owner, use unique pointer instead. If anybody tells you, oh, we have this owner thing in the core guidelines, don't. Tell them, use unique pointer. Take that message. I believe I can prove it. 
If you have code where you say, oh no, unique pointer doesn't work for Moose, send it to me, I will take a look, I write a, even uh, sign an NDA if I need to do that for looking at the code, I, never, I will try to tell you how to get rid of that. Um, that's how you, you should do unique pointers uh, with C derived pointers that you actually have to free. The classic way is actually, oh, you use a unique pointer where you pass in std free address as the free object. The problem is those unique pointers actually are double the size of a unique pointer because they need to keep the function pointer around which is ridiculous because in the C case it's always free and that's why I show you how to do it differently. If you have these things, define your own free deleter struct and using a type alias unique C pointer and those will actually can wrap these things and it's the same size as a regular pointer so it's no overhead at all and it will clean up always and it will always do ownership transfer correctly. So anybody is still using pointers that they have to free. C APIs. Some of the low level people using C APIs getting pointers. Wrap them like that. And if you want, intend to know how a unique pointer is, a unique resource is implemented or specified, go to that link, uh, P0052 and WG21 link provides you access for all standardization papers that happen to be around and it's really one of the best things that happened to the standardization process in the past years. That one and Godbolt Compiler Explorer. Um, wrap only a single resource and that's actually just to give you an overview. There are plenty of rules about functions. There are plenty of rules about classes and hierarchies and here's uh, some of that my students implemented. Okay, destructors should, all, should be declared no except. Why that? Because they are implicitly no except already. And if a destructor throws, what happens? Terminate. Arnold comes to you. <laughs> Constants and immutability, I told you, add const qualifications wherever you can. So if you have existing code bases or write new code or want to learn more about how to write better C, the core guidelines are at least something to consider. There's a lot of duplication to other guidelines and the new MISRA C++ which is in the making and it will take at least, to my, in my opinion, another two years to get something that's usable. The AutoSAR guidelines who, who did a lot of work that might influence MISRA C++ is still requires work. WG23 is also Happy to collaborate with WG21 on providing vulnerabilities guidelines for C++. And we provide actually developer tools helping you to modernize your code. We even implemented C++ modernization guidelines before the core guidelines were perceived. So it's not something new for us to write checkers for your code and suggest improvements like getting rid of pointers, getting rid of character pointers and things like that. And if you want to try C develop, just wait a couple of days before you download it if you don't have it already because we are just preparing a release. It's since we don't get money for it yet. For us, it's the <laughs> best. Uh, it's we can all, only do that when we have time to do it, and not when we, we we cannot schedule things as perfectly. So, if there are people here who actually can buy either commercial licenses or, let's say, uh, help us funding. And funding in Switzerland always means it has to be at least a five-digit number, otherwise it's not considerable writing an invoice, at least with our bookkeeping department. Uh, so uh, maybe we, and, and I asked, I ask our management director if we can set up a micropayment site for, let's say, contributions by the community and users. And he said, no way. 
or it would be so, let's say, an invoice costs out at least, at least a few hundred Swiss francs to actually process it. Just processing it. Um, but that's a public uh, environment, so public service environment. Uh, I have some developed flyers, so for those of you who want to learn about more about the features, come to me after the talk. I think, I think we still have a couple of half an hour or so to socialize and, and you can get something back. And well, that's just an overview of the core guideline checkers that are available and other useful things like getting rid of uh, uh, C strings and uh, C arrays. And that's the campus in winter. It looked like that this winter, but only uh, because of the lake, it's not as uh, that cold very often anymore. And we even have fans on GitHub. Without asking them, they like it. And I have plenty of these uh, uh, QR codes for you to take home if you want to download it, so no need. And it's, it's quite unique. It's like developed with a C in the front. And there are questions. No, it's deliberately an IDE. It works with any compiler that you configure it with. And it has its own parser and infrastructure. And there's a talk by the Jet, uh, JetBrains girl who's doing the um, JetBrains uh, C++ IDE, Anastasia. And she, I know her quite well. And she tells you why an IDE needs a different parser and infrastructure than a compiler. Well, the, this, no, no, let's say, this is a tool that the users will use, the developers will use. For continuous integration, you buy your uh, PRQA, uh, QAC++, your PCLint, or even Clockwork, which is the most expensive as far as I know, and put that on their build server. This is for the developers to get the quick fixes and not check in code that is too bad. So you only get a few hundreds of violations by, by clockwork and not a, a few ten thousands. So, sorry, I couldn't hear that. If you are a developer and not using an IDE, you are not a professional. Full stop. <laughs> And I used VI well before Vim was perceived. I even known, knew how to use add on a version 7, so Unix version 7, who's old enough to know that, uh, before you were born, I guess. <laughs> If you're in a land where cash misses are an issue, contiguous code without branches, because a lot of stuff gets inline, and contiguous data structures like std array or std vector are what you actually want to do, and not using lists. So if you have existing code where cash misses are an issue that is so old, I believe it might not have been a different cache architecture, so it would no longer behave to the properties the original designers actually perceived when they did that. I know people actually measure things like that, but then they write up and code dump algorithms that are inefficient and just to make it faster, perceived faster, but spending more CPU time instead. So first make your code right, make it const safe, which gives the compiler a lot more opportunities to optimize away stuff, and then you might look at going faster. I know the game in industry is behaving differently and they have their heroes and they might have their reasons to do things, but a lot of, let's say, myths around there are no longer true because when they actually started out with stuff, things have changed. And things will change in the future just to get rid of the spectra uh, uh, problems and uh, things like that. And we will have new things and hardware will change faster than we can change our software.
So let the compiler do their job, like ARM people, uh, and ask them, kick them in the butt to actually get better optimizers. Because the theory is there, it's just a matter of doing it right. Well, More questions, yeah. Comment on that. If, if Uh, the best thing is ask them, do you have performance tests that I can run on my code when I changed it? Yeah. And you shouldn't actually get into that argument if there are no performance tests. And this other thing, do you have unit tests that I can run so I can prove that my code does behave the same? And if they have neither, just dump the code and rewrite it <laughs> with tests. You see, I'm a professor. I can be, uh, let's say, despotic. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't have a moderator who, who keeps, uh, uh, but, but you haven't asked a question yet. Uh, let me tell you this, a, a little bit of a history of CVELOP. In 2005, just after I started at, as a university professor, I came up with the idea, okay, we have these nice, interesting Java refactoring tools in Eclipse and in other IDEs. I want that for C++, because I believe Java is a mistake. It's just, it happened, <laughs> it started out as an excuse for not C using C++ and uh, got, uh, let's say, popularized by hardware vendors so they could, could sell bigger servers. So, and I looked around, I looked at the GCC parser because that was available and it was such a mess written in C that at that time it was impossible to do something decent on the internal data structures, like refactoring or regenerating code from the AST. Then came Eclipse CDT. I also look, tried to look at what Visual Studio might provide. I called even friends at Microsoft. And the problem is, their compilers, even older than GCC, and they employ other vendors' parsers to do things like class browsers, or, or maybe not the class browser, but things like uh, Visual Assist. And also, the API that they provide is too weak to do reasonable refactoring, and you cannot get to the guts of the parser that you want to do that. And so we, the only tool that we could use to get a, a start was Eclipse CDT, because it is impossible to write your own C++ parser in a reasonable time frame, let's say with student resources. Even professionals take a hard time, so Clang came around and everybody's grabbing that now, because in a commercial setting, even Microsoft is using it. So, so we were stuck in 2005, 2006, 2008 with the only tool available to start out, so, and we didn't it didn't come with refactoring infrastructure. So we actually created that with my students, with my assistants, on government money, on profits that I made from other consulting jobs and, and stuff uh, that we made money from. And we created the refactoring infrastructure of Eclipse CDT. And for decent refactoring, you need to have a whole program view, which is not what a typical compiler parser has. A typical compiler parser is, I see one translation unit, I do with it whatever it tells me to do, and that's it. And then I give the job to the linker to get things done. There are people working on now, now, 10 years later, on Clang to get this kind of whole program view to get better optimization and, and better parsing, but it's not there. And it, it's a lot of work to get good refactoring that it works. And also, that is usable. So we created that infrastructure. Fortunately, someone in a CDT project actually created that code analysis framework where, where it's quite easy to plug into and use the AST and the parser infrastructure or the result of the parser infrastructure to, to do a static analysis tooling. And we have now the refactoring infrastructure for the uh, changing st uh, stuff. So that's why an IDE came around. And if you look at C-Lion, they are suffering a lot of the, let's say, birth pains that we had 
also in the past, just a couple of years earlier, and with much less manpower. So that's why it's separate story. And because we have the whole program view, we can do better analysis in, in across translation units, unless you're lying to the tool and don't configure your project correctly. But that's your problem. Another question? Yeah. Uh, no, they, they are doing their own stuff. And even they now actually call out to Clang for some of their analysis because it's just too hard for them to get their parser right. But we are close enough that it's useful. We, let's say it like that. And if anybody has money to spend, we could make it even more useful. You just don't have the funding to, to provide that and we don't have a means to sell it reasonably like, okay, give us 10 euros for, uh, let's say, because you like us and then if plenty enough people actually would do that, it would be sufficient, but we cannot actually collect that kind of money. Uh, I have a student project that is currently providing the CMake integration and it should be available not with this release but with the next release 2.0. It's, it's done. Let's say the student has to write his report but it's done. Yeah? Um, how about plugins to other uh, items like uh, Atom for example or Creator for those who have to use Those are editors not IDEs. Most of them. I, uh, the problem is uh, they will do a, a lot of good things using Clang now, but they won't get the same level of refactoring infrastructure that we rely on. And we cannot, let's say, support plenty of tools. And there are many other people working on Clang. We are one of the few people still working on Eclipse CDT. We are not the only committers, but we are one of the few groups that still actively work on it and provide things like C++ 17-fold expressions, like C++ 14 support, and it's a lot of work. It's not easy, not simple, and so anybody here has written or contributed to a C++ parser? Okay, those would, ha would appreciate it, and if you ask Anastasia from JetBrains, she will tell you, yeah, it's a lot of work. And they have, uh, what, uh, they have a few of the best compiler people there. It's, it's not just a plugin for Eclipse, it's a branded Eclipse CDT with some with additional plugins. When we started out, we said, uh, we told the people, oh, go to this side where there's this plugin from us and go to that side, there's another plugin from us and combine them. And keeping that up to date and working together is, is tough. And that's when we started out and, and uh, brand, uh, made our own, let's say, distribution, which also means we are sometimes a little bit behind CDT depending on resources or depending on bugs in CDT that we don't want to push to our users. Um, so, but we more or less try to follow the CDT release cycle with our releases. We might skip one or the other and we might be a little bit late depending on resources or semester schedule when, when we actually have time working, but we, we have the people who, who, who work on that and do it. And I use it for my teaching as well. So all my students will write C++ in Cvelop. And if I see them with the C line open, I will not help them in their exercises. Even though they are doing good stuff. So it's, it's a different setting. If you're happy with C line, it's, it's okay. Use it. We try to be better in some areas. And you told us many things about static compile time checks. And we have also seen some static asserts. But I want to know what is your opinion about runtime asserts or enforce pre and post conditions in the real in safety critical code? In safety critical code, you don't want to have a runtime check fail because that means you have a program error. If you have, let's say, an invalid input and can detect that, that is something that in a safety critical system must be the regular control flow. Yes, that's not an assert. It's not an assert. Um, my opinion is write unit tests and test your code with that. And Actually, if you have pre and post conditions, write code that violates it and show how it behaves when it's violated. 
pre and post conditions are a good thinking model, but for safety critical code, they are not a good implementation strategy. Because would you, uh, and we will get some support for contracts in C++ in the future. There will be, I believe, a contracts TS sometime soon. And the problem is there, how do you specify how your code behaves as a contract is violated? Is it just undefined behavior? So it depends on how you configure your tooling or is it implementation defined? Do you need different modes like, oh, I want these checks for the tests, but I don't want them at runtime in my system because it's too slow or I get cache misses or whatever. And that's the tough part about if you include C assert in your code base, for me it shows a problem. It's a problem indicator. Because either you're too lazy to actually write decent error checks in your code and error handling, or you lack external unit tests that actually employ the software in a way that you get what you want. And also C assert is so siege and it uses the preprocessor. We have a plugin that gets rid of macros. <laughs> I I think time is out, isn't it? I, I have to look where where where's Jan or some of the organizers. Um, anybody want to see develop in action? I have to excuse it's the old release, and it's a, a crumbled workspace, and I might actually run into problems with it. But at least you can, you can see a little bit how it looks. And maybe um, just, for example, we used the fish shell, as an example project, you might not be able to read that. The fish shell is, is a kind of a, 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 a shell, like a Unix shell, and it's written in C++, and it's, uh, the version that we use for that is kind of... Uh, it's known that it has problems. Let's say it like that. And if we run our static analysis tooling, and it still might be too small for you to read, you see things, oh, there's null which is no longer C++, we have null pointer, we have uninitialized variables or variables not initialized with curly braces. What else do we detect? Oh, not much here. Uh, we have 91 places where cons could have, could have been added, and that's just for one file. Uh, what else? Oh, we have core guidelines uh, violations like, okay, in-class member variables should be default initialized. That's uh, something that we got from C++11. Uh, avoid narrowing integer char function co argument conversions, which is a tricky thing in C++, integral promotion and conver automatic conversions. Avoid sign to unsigned function argument conversions, which is also a tricky thing. You might end up with negative numbers or very large positive ones. Like, oh, um, I just, I, I was correcting the exam last week, and let's say a, ho a large group of my students wrote things like, oh, if uh, the index is less than size minus one. And that's the error condition. If you have a standard container, what is this, the return type of size? Is an unsigned integer. What is if the container is empty? Now you subtract one from an unsigned number zero. It's still unsigned, isn't it? It's just large. So your index will always be smaller than that one. Interesting. So I just have to say, confess, I failed to teach them unsigned arithmetic. Or they, they fail to pay attention when we try to. Um, 
Yeah, if you must use a cast, use a named cast. Oh, maybe my index is wrong now because some code changed. Uh, where is the cast? I forgot it. That didn't work. That's one of the show, show something. Come on. I, the problem is I don't hit the correct focus point because the cursor is too big. Uh, Ah, here. Size T. How can we fix that? Control 1, use static cast. Ta da! And here, oh, this should be const because it's not changed and we have a return here. And it's even on the left hand side because it's configured like that. Which is wrong, by the way. Right? Let, 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 just a quick poll for the uh, for me. Who is r using West Coast const? <laughs> West Coast const. Like this one. Who is using the right East Coast const? Who is doing both? <laughs> that's that's something to get rid of. Okay, I, I, I think that's enough for the moment. Just see, it's real life code. It worked with real life code, not only, let's say, uh, toy examples. And uh, you see how things, you can incrementally think that's also something where an IDE is important. An offline tool always has to be perfect. Here I see what the tool is doing for me. So even if I have plenty of changes, I can do that, adapt them incrementally, and that helps a lot to convince myself that it's still correct, the code that comes out of it. I wouldn't trust even the clang tidy thing to do always everything perfectly. Okay, I, I think I'm finished for tonight because I want to drink my Augustiner to get my <laughs> throat better again. Thank you very much for listening, and I will... Uh,